There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Oh, by the way, thank you for the, the latest tweet you forwarded to me. But actually, I can't stand Barbara Commons. Did you think it was Barbara Pym? Ah, yes, yes. Sorry, yes. Do you Have you tried Barbara Commons? Uh, you probably no. would love her. Everybody loves her. I can't stand her stuff. It's so weird <laughs> for me. <laughs> well, 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 treat, treat my tweet as a warning to stay away from it then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I figure I need, I need to figure out why do I, why, why do I have this weird negative experience and everybody else like James and Dory and they worship her. And it's like, what, what am I missing? I can't, I bailed on two of her books. So I, I really, I really, I, I, more than anyone else I sort of interact with through, through the book world, I admire hugely your, uh, your, your stout reading sovereignty. Uh, oh, oh, I stout reading sovereignty. That is fabulous. I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I think it's because, you know, what a lot of writers, I, I, I get to know more and more writers the longer I'm involved in the book world. And the biggest problem they have is books being sent to them that they didn't ask for or look for and feeling they need to the support their writers. They're being asked by their publishers or agents to kind of blurb stuff and, and try to just carve out reading space. I find since I started reviewing, like I review about 20 books a year, which isn't that much in you know, in terms of overall, but I read differently when you're reviewing your writing reviews and it takes a lot of time. And then if you, um, you know, I, I try to be supportive. So I would read a few for blurbs and then I would, like if, if, if I wasn't careful, my whole reading life could be taken over by reading what other people want me to read. And actually the only thing I have, I've never done a writing course. I don't have any particular support for my writing other than my reading. And I, I it's really important. So I, 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 you know, I'm really always impressed by how, you're you're on one hand you can read a book by an author and love it and hate the next book and still read a third book and, and you know to have that clarity i think is brilliant because i know i've seen in your videos over time as you've become better known uh, and more people are aware of you that you're you get sent more books or maybe writers look out for you a bit more um but you've you, you've kept your own shawness uh, and I yeah, think that's, really I, I, that's important for me. So I don't want to get a whole bunch of books from the same publisher and I've run into problems that way. And so I, I just set boundaries right off the outset. The outset of the, okay, if you want to send me a couple, great. If I don't like them, I'm going to talk about them in Ray Farty Reads, but I won't do a takedown review and I will pass them on to another reader that might like them better. And that's the deal I make. That yeah. if I don't like it, I, I will talk about it in my Friday Reads, but I won't do a special standalone takedown review but how, i hope i love it and in, in which case i will do a standalone review and and they they kind of go for that so yeah i think uh, yeah publisher, publishers i feel are on a daily basis in the business of sending rejection you know they 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 reject 999 writers out of a thousand yeah. and they're they're used to giving not lo not loving everything and seeing stuff that's good but just not for them and all the use, usual sort of pro forma ways in which they say no. Uh, so I think they have to be adults about it too. You know, that I think readers are entitled because you read a book, like the average reading speed is about a page every two minutes. So that's 30 pages an hour. So an average novel is eight to 10 hours. And I think if I spent eight to 10 hours with somebody where they're just talking the whole time, at the end of it, I'm entitled to say whether I like the person or not. That's you know, and I feel that way about books. And now, our feature presentation. I wanted to like to have my friend and the preeminent Irish novelist, Ronan Hessian, back. Hello, Ronan. Hi, Sean, and thanks so much for having me on again. It's been too long since we spoke, but always a pleasure to chat to you again. Yes, well, the suspense has been killing me. So if you don't know, um, Ronan is the author of two best-selling novels, the first one was what 2019 Leonard and Hungry Paul and then in 2021 Paninka. So do check those out and he is also one of the most incredible voracious uh, diverse readers on the planet. So I have invited him back to just tell me what he's been reading. So 
Ronan, what have you been reading? Well, thanks, Sean. Like, of course, I often get reading ideas from, from yourself as well. I'm sure we'll have a couple of common mm -hmm. names. So I'm surrounded by a table of books, which I grabbed. Any gaps in my bookshelf behind me are books that I've grabbed for, for our chat. Um, so I've had, like, last year, I think it was a, a, overall a good reading year. What I found is there were, I read a lot of, maybe a lot of new things that I felt were good, but didn't necessarily fall in love with. There were a small number I did fall in love with. Uh, and then I found myself just maybe stepping off the carousel of new releases a bit and looking for, you know, picking books that had maybe been out a couple of years or that sometimes, you know, a book's been on your shelf for a period of time, a year, two years, three years, and you've looked at it loads of times. And then just one day, it's just the right day and you just pick it and you're like, I'm so glad I waited. So I've had a few a few experiences like that and also a little bit of non-fiction mixed in as well which i think is it's interesting i don't read a, a lot of non-fiction but because i was writing i was working on a new book over, over the last year i have to really be careful because on the one hand i have to select reading that ignites my imagination but i can't read stuff that i feel will put my head in the wrong place so it's it's this real delicate dance between it has to be uh, you know consonant with what i'm re what i'm writing but not so close that it'll leak into it so i have well, to well tell us about this dance card because that sounds really fascinating i think one of the books i really loved it came at the end of 2021 but one of my favorite reading experiences is uh, osobal by marit kapla yes so, that oh, one sounds have... fascinating so it's translated by i just got the translator's name it's peter graves uh, it's a big, thick book, okay? And you might think, well, that's a bit of a commitment and, you know, Ronan, you better blow my mind before I'm going to, you know, attempt something. But you'll see that it's sort of written in this sort of format. So it's written more like almost poetry. And what it what it is, it's the, the writer, Mark Kapla, went, Osobal is a small Swedish town. Uh, I don't know the overall population. And every every chapter begins with, with this diagram. Okay. Those birds flying? They are little rectangles. And you'll see in this case that one of them is slightly darker. Yeah. And what you realize is this is actually a map of Osobal. And these are all the houses in Osobal. And each chapter, she's talking to whoever lives in the house that's highlighted. And as you go through it, they're just people talking about their own lives. And for example, in this one, you'll see the person was born at the bottom in 1960 sorry we'll get my camera 1969 so and then you'll see in other cases there might be a particular character where there's a second year which so the person died the person died si since they were spoken to and by the time the book was published so it's it's kind of an oral history of a town that's and it's it's i hesitate to describe it as non-fiction because i think a big part of fiction to me is extracting narrative uh, and i think what marit kapla does is she extracts the narrative the editing the presentation of it and the line breaks you know it's just the way you can read something like even just randomly here's a page from someone called ake Ackelson, born in 1947 and one this is one just one page i come from a family that showed aggression as well as love and tenderness. If you're given love and tenderness, you can put up with a clip around the ear. A clip is a, a little light um, smack. As far as I'm concerned, a clip around the ear isn't assault, but a clenched fist certainly is. And that's it. So you will just have ordinary people who aren't, and I think what's really remarkable is that the, their contributions are not in any way self-conscious. So they're not conscious that I need to sound clever, original, or perhaps they did start that way, but Marit Kapla had the patience to let them talk that out before they got to the real stuff. So that really is a gem. And, you know, I hope it, I think it, I think it won a lot of prizes in Sweden, but in a way, on one hand, I hope it gets recognition, but it's such a kind of quiet, perfect book that it sort of does not, almost doesn't belong in sort of black tie dinners and stuff. It's one thing actually that struck me about it. I showed you the cover a second ago. I, this year, because I read a few hardbacks, I started to really enjoy you know the sort of nakedness of hardbacks i kind of love not the sort of very very pale green 
Uh, and I oh, it is. Of, okay. Yes, it is. That's so when right. I'm reading, because I'm reading them on the train, I will, I will often take off the cover and just yes. carry this, carry it like this. And I've kind of, I like the libraryness of, of, of that sort of, you know, undressed, state of undress. Uh, but I, I assure you that I only read fully dressed myself. Um, I, I, well, I'm just going to say this is this conversation is getting naughtier by the second. <laughs> <laughs> so the other book that I have been and I'm not finished, but I'm working through and I read a little bit every weekend is is a book. This you might have seen me tweeting about this. I did. I remember. So Archipelago was a literary journal that ran from 2007 to 2019, and people like Seamus Heaney and and you know many eminent writers. And it's, it's a mix of poetry, nonfiction, uh, photographs, all about islands, in particular the islands of the, the British Isles, or, you know, in other words, the Ireland, island of Britain and Ireland. So the islands of Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England, and then, of course, more widely looking around the world. So it's really beautiful writing. But the thing I really loved about it is that I think with nature writing, one thing that I always resisted was the sort of sentiment that isn't nature beautiful and awesome and aren't humans so insignificant and kind of not really kind of we kind of spoil nature and just kind of stays there almost kind of gazing at it as an object without engaging with it and without uh, integrating the human experience into into nature where this book doesn't do that uh, it writes beautifully and very originally about the experience of islands and because i'm writing i need to try and you know, expose myself to what I stimulate in literature, but not something that will, uh, something that's different enough that I can't copy it. And I, do, I don't inadvertently come under the influence. And I, I've read an awful lot. I found re loads of inspiration, I think, in, in reading Chinese literature. Uh, I think it kind of surprises me, like, as, as you know, like both, we, we would have probably initially sort of bonded from a book point of view over Japanese literature, which is very prominent in the West. Whereas Chinese literature isn't, uh, and I'm not exactly sure whether there are sort of publishing reasons for that. But when I started to explore, I found it in incredibly uh, diverse and exciting. And I think one of the big differences I think is I found, I know it's kind of inappropriate to just casually compare Japanese and Chinese, but one of the things that when I, having read a lot of Japanese and instead of reading Chinese, I noticed was that a lot of Japanese literature is urban, you know, city-based, very modern, whereas a lot of the, Chinese literature I've been reading, it has more rural settings and particularly there's a much more, much stronger political backdrop to it. So particularly I read, so there's three books in particular around the cultural revolution. So, you know, I'm no historian, but, but essentially from the mid sixties until Chairman Mao died in, in the mid seventies, the cultural revolution was really a movement of around um, a mix of indoctrination and also somewhat of a purge of what would be seen as sort of Western or, or capitalist ideas. And essentially what happened was that there was a very strong idea control and a manipulation of language so that people would use stock phrases from Mao's books to incriminate each other and to, to uh, report on each other. Uh, and there's some really stark but incredibly imaginative literature around that period. And it's one of the unfortunate things about the way the world works and how we receive translated literature at this very important period in, in world history really is not as widely written about uh, for, for the Western reader unless you seek it out. So so one book that came out and which I actually reviewed for the Irish Times is uh, Hard Like Water by Jan Lianka, mm -hmm. who's a very well established uh, Chinese writer and is probably, his name is often dropped in the context of the Nobel Prize uh, as, as a possible likely winner because there's only ever been two Chinese laureates. It's, it's translated by Carlos Rojas, I don't know, or Rojas, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. And it's a really interesting story because it mixes in a sort of very passionate and very sort of physical sexual relationship with uh, between these two slightly crazy, outrageous uh, young people who through their mastery of the vocabulary and the language of Chairman Mao, effectively get all the way to the top in politics uh, and in local politics and, and community politics. And it's just, it, it, he's brilliant on the absurdity of politics. I think two more, two kind of sadder books about the period. This is one that I think is from the 76, I think, or thereabouts, or oh, sorry, 86. So this is Half of Man as Woman 
by Zhang Jianglang and translated by Martha Avery. You can see on the cover there. I love the cover of that. And this is really about his experience in work camps. A big part of the Cultural Revolution was, you know, people uh, would be in work camps. So he was, the actual author himself was in work camps for, I think, the guts of 20 years. And it's about his experience of romantic relationship with a woman there, and also just the effect on his spirit of, of being there and his creativity. It's a really powerful book. And then it's a, this one has quite a grim cover. It's published by Hanford Star. It's called Ninth Building. And it's by Zhu Jingji and translated by Jeremy Tiang, who you probably know. He's translated many, many high profile books. And in fact, I know you're a, an avid reader of translated fiction. And I certainly find that after a while, you get to know who the translators are and you will almost look out for their name, in, you know, in terms of if you see it's translated by somebody, you'll say, well, I'll give that a go because they, they're normally a good symbol of quality. So, so Ninth Building is a really interesting book because the author, Zhu Jingji, is actually quite a well-known film director, uh, including in the West. He really writes about his experience of being a child in that period. And I, I also reviewed this uh, for the Irish Times, and I said it took me a while to figure out what was missing from it as a memoir. And then I realized it was missing a childhood because the children were sent to work camps. There is a very uh, vivid scene where some of the children, they... Uh, they accuse an older woman who would have been a sort of respected older woman and a peasant woman of uh, having sort of anti-revolutionary ideas and they sort of bind her hands and feet and they're making her crawl around on a ping pong table so it's just this this and it's quite similar in a ways to what people say about nazi germany that the people who were really the stormtroopers were the sort of the thugs they were the, the people the, they weren't political people they were just petty criminals really and people who were you know there was no ideology there it was just a certain ugly side of society that got promoted but it's a very interesting book i think because what it sort of shows is that if you were around at that time it was very hard not to be implicated and so you come out of that period on the one hand victimized by it and traumatized by it but also implicated as a perpetrator just by being there and your mode of survival wasn't sometimes at the expense of other people so I think it's very interested. I'm really interested at a time when I think in, in modern discourse, people can be very black and white about I want to know who was right and who was wrong. I'm really interested in, in books and characters that explore people who have those, the, the light and dark in them, you know, and people who are not reconciled. I want to just sneak in a comment here. I just put up a chat on my channel with Eric Carl Anderson, who I know you follow about a Chinese novel that traces the effects through three generations of the Cultural Revolution. It's called Cocoon by Zhang Yuran, translated by Jeremy Tiang. So if you haven't read that book or seen our chat, I recommend it to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I actually, I bought that recently. And I think you might have mentioned it in a Friday Reads previously, did you? I, I when probably you bought... did, because I, yeah, I read it uh, maybe November or something, and, and the, I finally yeah, edited book... the chat. Yeah, or a book sure. haul video or something. So actually, I picked it up and it only arrived a few days ago. So I hopefully read it soon and, and look forward to your video with, with Eric Carl Anderson because I always like seeing his thoughts on, on books. He's another very diverse reading taste. And then just, I, I suppose, moving on, to, again, staying with Chinese literature, looking at, I'm really interested in the transition that China Chinese society has made to modernity and the fantastic wealth and the fantastic explosion in development and what's been gained and lost in that. And these two novels really explore that. One is Rue Street by Shuang Tao, And again, apologies for pronunciations. This is another Jeremy Tiang. And these are three novellas. And they're, they're set around one particular street, a big looping street, which is translated here as Rue Street. So it has a different name throughout the text. And really it captures that, you know, an area that's been overdeveloped and changed, but it hasn't quite lost the the local population or the local culture. So in other words, you have this overlay of modernity without really any sort of reform or change of the underlying community. And it's just very interesting tension. And I'm particularly interested in that because a lot of the writers I've read in translation tend to be older, you know. So this is a young writer sort of born in the early 80s. So really interested in read what newer writers are saying. Then at the other end, you have a writer called uh, Li Peifu and a novel called Graft, translated by James Trapp. I love that cover. Yeah, I really, this is from Sinoist Books, who are based in London and publish exclusively Chinese literature. 
and they do beautifully produce. And in particular, I have another one of theirs I'll be talking about in a minute. But if you, I spoke about undressing books, but their attention to the, the, the cover, like underneath the beautiful mm, copper, goodness. reflective copper. And again, this is a book, Graft, Li Pei Fu. You can see him there. He's quite a, he's an older writer, very yeah. well established in China. And it's about a guy who is, uh, he's an agricultural scientist and a graft being an agricultural term where you take, uh, you know, a branch of one. I'm sure, you know, your parents have a farm, you're familiar with the concept, but uh, he does it in a way essentially that is very important for the agricultural practices. And he gets promoted to very senior position in the regime, but he never really loses touch with his peasant roots, but he does get caught. He's, he's overtaken really by the sort of swarm of modernity and the corruption and the pressures and it's just interesting the way in which those things almost become inevitable when you're in a system that's broken you can't go cleanly through it and it's just really interested and i think what while these are interesting in terms of understanding some of what's going on in china what i really love about chinese literature is the they're very people focused you know their insight into human nature is really good i also there's a bit of coarseness there i like uh, you know which i think I find Japanese literature, I, I love it, but sometimes it's a bit more reserved. It's a kind of a coarseness and an ugliness. Like one of the books I think I might have spoken to you about last time was Shadow of the Hunter, which I think was also translated by James Trapp, not a Sinoist book by uh, Su Tong. And, you know, it, it has the best use of casual bad language I've, I've read in a novel. You know, there's one one woman, and you can cut this if you don't want the bad language in your... No, in your, no, no worries, you know. no. Which, but her casual reference to her boyfriend, even when he's in the room, is to call him a world-class stupid cunt. And just throughout the book, his name is, whenever she's talking about it, just, people just casually, oh, where's world-class stupid cunt today? Oh, he's working. They're not, they're not even trying to be offensive. It's just how they revert to him. You know, and I love that, there's just that coarseness, which I think coming from Dublin, I've always liked that sort of, a little bit of cursing is always great fun. Just a couple of our Chinese books. One writer who I think is, it's hard work, but it's amazing. Is Kanju. Anytime I read Kanju, I feel like somebody is rewiring my brain. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what each sentence means. And then I come back, sort of feel like that was kind of fun in a kind of uh, masochistic sort of way. I've read a couple of her novels, and I, I, the nearest I can think is some like Bei Sua, the, the Korean writer who's kind of similar, similar, you know. Uh, just unpo unknowable in her, in her writing. This is translated by Karen Gernot and, and, and Chen Zeping. And this is a collection of short stories. It was long listed for, for the International Booker. And I actually feel that her short stories may be the way into Kanju's brain. I think there's something about the, the tightness of them and the focus of them that like each word makes sense to the next word and each sentence makes sense to the next sentence. But the first sentence and the third sentence don't necessarily make sense to each other. But there's something about it that's almost like abstract art. It's almost like, you know, free jazz or something where there is, she knows what she's doing. This is not just random word placement or like AI writing a novel or something like that. There, there are twists and turns that, that your brain recognizes. And I just, I just think she's a really interesting writer. And so I find whenever I read her, I come away my imagination on fire, you know. Two more Chinese books. Again, going back to more traditional writing. So one of the, another very good writer is uh, Zha Pinghua, and again, published by Sinoist Book, Books, and this is translated by Christopher Payne. This is a story of the Mountain Whisperer, who's kind of like a sort of witch doctor type who kind of performs a funeral, sings songs, and will sing for five hours, six hours, traditional songs to, to commend the soul of the the deceased to the next life. And it really is a story about sort of banditry in the mountains. It's done as sort of four books, but it's actually a load of, it's almost like folklore. And it's sort of set in a sort of timeless period of just incidents with bandits. And again, it has that coarseness and funniness about it. And again, they just, they, they produce these books so well, like the, 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 um, the cover underneath when you remove remove the cover it's just so beautifully done you know they just it's that attention that i think uh shows a sort of it gives me the sense that a book is being kind of lovingly published because that can't be commercially 
attractive to do. That you only do that if you you're publishing books that you you think people will hold on to for a long time. And and as a reader, uh, I respond to that. Then another the final Chinese book. Um, for people who don't like Chinese literature, um, it's nearly over. This one is I don't know if you if this was uh, uh, whether you got this in Canada, but certainly in Ireland it was very popular. UK is very popular. Monkey Magic. Do you remember that? It's about oh I don't. There's a J-pop group, a Japanese pop group called Monkey Magic, but that's the only association I have with that so term. It was, it was about this monkey who, according to the theme song, was born in an egg on a mountain top, the funkiest monkey there ever was. And he basically, it's based on a, it's this classic story, it's basically called Journey to the West, which is a 16th century Chinese story about a Buddhist monk called Tripitaka, who travels uh, to the West to pick up the original Buddhist scriptures. And it's really about introducing Buddhism into, into China, right? But it's, he's accompanied by this monkey who, who's sort of made human, who he kind of controls, and then a pig, and then another guy with sort of skulls around his neck. And they're, they're kind of idiots. And so you have this wise young monk accompanied by three idiots, and they encounter all sorts of deities and fantastic creatures. And it's, it's one of those classic stories and it's lasted hundreds of years. But this is a this is a sort of I hesitate to say condensed version, but it is slightly abridged translation by uh, Julia Lovell. And I must say it was great fun. You know, mm -hmm. uh, some books I've read, uh, the Count of Monte Cristo was one where I just had such a great time reading it. Every, every uh, you know, there's just lots of sort of crazy things happening. It's completely goofy and stupid. And, but it's also, there are, it's kind of, um, Buddhists dissing Taoists uh, throughout the whole thing. So the whole, I just found it very, I, I was expecting it to be quite dry and heavy. Like I'm never drawn to, you know, when people say, oh, here's a modern retelling of the Iliad. Like I, I, I'm never attracted by modern retellings, but this one, I, you know, was really pleasant surprise. So I just thought, seeing as we were talking, I'd take the opportunity to really just focus on a bit of Chinese literature because I just felt there's a lot of good stuff that people might be interested to know about. and. Hopefully there's something in that. But I have some very, stuff. Very little of which I've ever heard of. So this is fantastic. Great, great. Well, certainly Sinois Books in London. I would encourage anyone to check out their website. They just do exclusively Chinese literature. Some of it's more commercial and some of it's more literary. But anything I've read from them has been very good quality. And they have very good translators working with them. And they also organize a lot of, you know, YouTube interviews, which are have live interpretation with Chinese authors. So I think it's really, you know, we know so much about American culture, but we, we don't really get the same exposure to Chinese history, culture, Chinese politics. We, we, it's very, very heavily filtered through the West. So I think it's always good to, to know what's going on. So, so just a bit closer to home, I just to pick a couple of Irish books um, oh, that, that I particularly enjoyed. My favorite Irish writer is uh, at the moment is uh, Adrian Duncan, who I think I've mentioned before. And yes, you have. His most recent novel is The Geometer Lavachevsky, which is, you know, you have to have either no wine or a lot of wine to pronounce that correctly. Uh, so I think uh, this is this is a slight, what Adrian does so well, Adrian's a, a civil engineer. So in other words, he worked on big building sites, building shopping centers and so on in Germany. But he's also a visual artist. He lives in Berlin. He really writes about his whole perspective is really filtered through his understanding of the sort of built environment, so structural engineering. So he will, in the same way that a, a nature writer would, would talk about how a particular, you know, forest might look or how a habitat might look or, the, or a particular behavior of a bird, he will notice that about a particular joint in a bridge, you know, or a particular road, the camber of a road. And he writes brilliantly about that. It's, and this is a slight departure for him in the sense that he's writing about a period in the 1950s where after Ireland had become sort of independent, where Ireland went through a phase of trying to invest in prestige uh, national infrastructure projects. So yeah. reservoirs, dams, uh, you know, the road infrastructure, electrification, rural electrification. And this geometer is basically a, a, a Russian who'd come over to Ireland to help with some of the surveying work, but actually was wanted back home in Russia and got sort of coded messages to return urgently. And he knows that if he returns, he's probably going to be either imprisoned or, or, or worse. So he hides out in Ireland. So it, 
it's unusual for Adrian to do historical to historical period, but it's it's a very worthwhile period for him to visit because he really understands the Irish state in its early stages, emerging from a, a colonial period, 400 years of having the um, attempts to try and establish its own. And, and obviously they didn't want to, you know, if they needed engineers, they didn't want to ask the English. So they hadn't got the expertise. They didn't want to, they had to go further afield. And so there's this kind of outsider who comes into a local, small local community from a Russian background. So really interesting. Probably what was the, the name of his earlier book that you talked about that was set? You said he worked as an engineer in Germany and this novel was about an engineer, yeah. an Irish engineer in Germany. What was that one called? Notes? That's something called, Notes? Yeah, Love Notes from a German building site. Yeah, I bought that from our earlier chat. I haven't got to it yet, but you've uh, you've put it back on my radar. Yeah, no, it's definitely very good. And he's done a very interesting nonfiction book this year. He had two books out this year, one about bungalow bliss, which is that a lot of the Irish countryside are littered, littered with all these bungalows who look the same. And it's because there was a book that came out where people could get floor plans for a house. And so they were able to build a house without using an architect. So it kind of, it kind of spoiled the countryside, but it's also a big part of our built heritage and culture. So he, he, he's the right man to take on those stories. Wendy Erskine, I spoke about before, her, her latest collection yes. of short stories, Dance Move, Wendy's stories are incredibly interesting. She amazed me in a way. I'm, I'm not a big short story reader because I'm, I'm, I'm more of a novel person. The sort of pace and structure of a novel. I kind of, when I open a book, I like to kind of feel myself going through that arc and that, I, that experience over a couple of days of going through a few hundred pages. So short stories, I kind of never know how to pace myself, but she had a very, very good debut collection called Sweet Home. Which and I, I think, enjoyed very much, yeah. Yeah, and that was that was pretty flawless as far as I could see. And with this second collection, you can just see when a writer is starting to grow, you know, you can see that there's just elements of sophistication. They're taking on certain risks. They're, they're making certain interesting choices. And that's what I love about Wendy. She makes interesting choices all the time. Sometimes I find short story collections to be kind of, you know, they're kind of boringly competent. All too often you can see there's going to be a little twist at the end an over-reliance and poignancy on the back end. There's kind of sometimes a kind of a, a lack of humor or personality, kind of it's kind of monotone, it's kind of serious, passive monotone. And that can really put me off in short story collections. But this one, I, I really felt was very lively. The third and final Irish book I'm going to talk about is, uh, and it's a book I, I mentioned it before, which is uh, Trespasses by uh, Louise Kennedy. Um, so I didn't remember it was you that told me about it. I have it. I'm doing it for the Irish Readathon this year. So tell me, wet my appetite further. So this is, it's set in a, in a border town in the 1980s. So at a period when the peace process in Northern Ireland had not yet taken effect and ordinary people found it very difficult to keep themselves separate from the IRA's campaign uh, of violence and the loyalist campaign of violence and in which the police force was also heavily implicated right and what it does um I, I often say that what i think the novel is extremely good for is treating the position of the individual the position of the society and the position of the individual in society uh, and i think this novel does that brilliantly it's a very tender uh, relationship story a family story I really liked um, Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan, but I actually think this is a better book. I really like Claire Keegan's book and I, I hugely admire her as a writer. But I think Louise Kennedy, I just felt that she, got, she, there were a lot of very difficult choices. Like even the 80s, the 80s are recent enough that people can remember it pretty clearly. So you have to get your period detail right. The, there are such subtleties of language. Like when you're talking about Northern Ireland or anywhere on the border, like your, your phrasing of a word could give away your politics. And even if it's not a political word, and she, she masters that. She, I often think you should judge books in the same scoring system they use in the Olympics for gymnastics, for difficulty and execution. So in other words, you can do something simple very, very well, and you'll get a, lo a medium mark. You can, you can do something very complicated badly, you'll get a medium mark. But a high mark is to do something difficult very well. Uh, and I think that's what she's done in, in Trespasses. 
Have you read her first, uh, her other book, which is the short story collection? At the end of the world, the cul-de-sac. I I have it. I've read. I probably read half of the story, so I read one one. Uh, sometimes I read so short awesome. stories cover to cover. So this one I've just decided I read uh, from time to time. So I haven't Good. finished it, but I'm curious about it as well. Uh, she's a very interesting person. Actually, she used to be a chef for many years. So she her today baby coming. She's in her fifties. She came to writing in her forties. So she's one of those people who their their talent has been simmering and then when when they finally uh, come into publication are fully formed and, and are very and like they come in at a very high level this is a debut novel but it certainly doesn't read like somebody's first effort at a novel yeah wait so i have a few i have a few more this one probably is now the best known of, of the books i have this is Percival everett the trees so well, I mentioned before at the, uh, around this time last year, I was still staying in a hotel while we we're having our house renovated. Uh, and at the time I was deep working on my new book and I hadn't got any time really for, sometimes publishers send you a proof and say, would you, would you consider doing a supportive quote for the cover, a blurb quote? Um, and I had really liked a few of Percival Everett's previous books and I'd written about them so uh, Influx Press, who, who published this in the UK, it had previously been published by Grey Wolf Press in the US. And they sent it to me and said, would, would, you, would you like to read this and, and let us know what you think? And even though I had no time, or I was, had way too much on my plate, I said, well, it's Percival Everett, so I'll do it. And I was so glad. It, it, it's, all, it's basically driven around Emmett Till, who was a young black man who was violently killed uh, in the US in the 1960s, I think. Uh, and is used as really a, an inspiration for what's a, what's a, I, I described him, I think, in the blurb as he's either the most serious, funny writer I've read or the funniest, serious writer I've read. So his books are incredibly funny. This book's somewhat violent. But if you want to read somebody who the, the issue of race can be very delicate at the time, and he deals with it with absolutely no delicacy whatsoever. Uh, and it's, he's, he's, it's commendable how he just delivers knockout punch after knockout punch. Uh, and it's a, it's a hugely enjoyable, very, very funny book. He's a very clever writer and he's a one soft. I don't think I've read anybody like him. And I think it's hard to find reader, writers where you can say that. And he also has a very good book, again, and it deals very well with race uh, called I'm Not Sidney Poitier. But the character's name is not Sidney Poitier. That's his name. So it's actually, it's not that he's saying I'm not Sidney Poitier. He's, he says, I am not Sidney Poitier. So that's that, not Sidney Poitier is the character. Um, is so it's better than being named um, uh, old greasy cunt or whatever that character <laughs> in that Chinese novel. Is. We're, we're not super cunt, yeah. Um, but I think I think that's actually I like I find names. I'll be talking about John Foss, John Foss in a minute. I think maybe I won't. I don't know the book here. But uh, you, I find names confusing in books, so I don't really pay attention to them really, and I'm always getting confused as to who's who. Uh, so. So I really like when people are called a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, or a world class supercunt, or not Sidney Poitier, because it takes zero mental effort to remember them. But if you have a lot of characters with the same first letter, say, so you have Mary and Marjorie and Marie, I'm like, in my head, they're all the same. Forget about it. I know uh, a writer you really admire is Dasha Durnditch. I do. I know you've read uh, Trieste, I think, and possibly uh, Doppelganger, maybe others as well. Um, just so three S so far, yeah. Yeah, so this is translated by Celia Hawksworth, who has translated all of Dasha Durnitz's novels except for Trieste, and mm -hmm. she also co-translated co uh, Doppelganger with uh, Susan Curtis, who's the, who's, who's the publisher of Estros Press, who, who published this. I'm really glad to see this. I reviewed this, and I really love this, actually. Often people, uh, when I sort of tweet about Dasha Durnitz, say, oh, would you recommend? And there's all these amazing books that are big and thick, which to a new reader is a bit of a commitment. So I'm, I'm glad there's a book of good quality that you can say, try this as a starting point, because it, it, it's a nice capsule of her writing style. So she mixes fiction plus ranting, uh, plus her opinionated way of writing. She is very funny. She's incredibly sharp. And what she's really writing about is with the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, the emigrants were arrived into Canada. And she kind of calls bullshit on two things. One is the sentimentality of the emigres. So in other words, the way in which they talk about their poor situation and how things were in the old country, but also the sort of 
patronizing benevolence of the receiving country. So the idea that you're welcome to our country, but only in the lowest paid, most insecure jobs. That's right. She really tackles that, but she doesn't tackle it in a sort of pompous way. So she doesn't sort of say these people are, she kind of recognizes it for what it is. There's a sort of a lack of interest. You know, people, it just doesn't matter enough to them to do any more than that. And for the people who are, you know, she talks about how so many emigres talk about their experience of the war. And yet she's saying, well, these people didn't fight in the war or, you know, they, 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 they contrived to uh, escape conscription because, you know, they had a flat feet or whatever. She's very clear eyed. But what I love about her writing, even when she writes, a lot of her novels are kind of almost Nazi hunting novels, you know. She can write about, she has the brilliant ability to thread anecdote and to make brilliant connections. So she can find a connection in history with an individual to a modern situation by a sort of triangulating it through some other point in a way that just, it, it shows a gift, not just for research, but for that, to build narrative. So it's, it's not just an information dump, it's just really interesting. Um, and it's a really interesting way of learning history. So I, I, I really, I, really is. Yeah, and, and TS is like a, a brilliant example of that. You know, you can, I work, I work as a civil servant, so I read a lot of government reports and a lot of, you know, current affairs stuff. So I don't really have the appetite in my personal reading to go into all that all over again. So somebody who can make that, excite me about that is is invaluable in my library. So Dasha Derndich always plays my heart. This other writer, I'm not sure if you've read Charles Boyle. Um, I have not. I'm not even sure if I'm familiar with him. Charles Boyle, I think, is one of the most underrated writers around. And one of the reasons, probably the main reason he's underrated, is because he's also one of the best publishers around because he runs CB Editions. He is the CB of CB Editions. Oh. Uh, so Charles has been writing for a long time, but I think to some extent his own writing has taken uh, sort of stood aside to, for his, and he's he, he published, you know, Agatha Christophe, and he's published loads of amazing, loads of amazing writers, poetry uh, as well as um, fiction, small publisher. This is his most recent book. His book, The Other Jackie Would Love, because it's about reading. But a lot of us, this is called 99 Interruptions, and it's about interruptions. There are 99 short pieces about the business of interruptions. And that's his, his basic theme for the whole book. So he talks about the act of reading is itself an interruption, and it's also interrupted. You never read a book in a full sitting. You have to have toilet breaks. That even in a secondhand bookshop, finding a turned down page is, is a historical record of an interruption. And so he has 99 interesting takes on interruptions. And that's what it is. And it's also, he dips into reading different books. He talks about his daily life. And it also involves conversations with his dead father, uh, who he imagines being in a coffee shop where he goes to do his reading. And I think it's, it's a very short book. It's only about, um, I would say about 25 pages. Um, and has 99. And one thing that Charles, it's a really important thing for a reader, uh, that a writer is good company on the page. Right. When you just like being around them, you like the way they think. And his book, The Other Jack, is really good because it's, it's about reading. And it's a really good book about reading called The Other Jack. So I would highly recommend, and actually anything on the CB Editions website, you know, get them all. Like, honestly, I've never read a bad CB Editions book. They're amazing. But Charles, I actually got the pleasure of meeting Charles recently um, in person because we've known each other through various uh, online events and so on. But uh, again, really interesting writer. And I think he's so, it's somewhat overshadowed by his brilliant publishing. The next book is a book you introduced me to and um, for which I am once more forever in your debt, which is Proletarka, Flary Yes, yes. I love that. And when you read, you read a page translated by Alistair McEwen, you read a page of it, and as soon as I heard the voice, I was like, gimme. That's, that's that kind of clean writing where somebody has a slightly wonky point of entry and they just keep hitting all these unusual notes and you're just left 
I've read so many books and yet how can somebody go in to a familiar setting like, for example, a discussion at a dinner table and not do any of the things I normally see those scenes do? I, 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 and I loved that sort of slightly, um, I'm not sure, what's what's the youngest daughter in the Adams family called? I forget. I kind of always pictured it, that, that, that it was so, so like just slightly sort of serious, old before her time and yet still an inner child perspective. And it's in, I've read, I think after reading this, I think I've read all her books, or there's one other I have to read, but the, the one, the nonfiction, but I read uh, The Water Statues and Sweet Days of Discipline as well. Uh, they're all very short and in a way you gobble them up and you're like, oh no, that's all, that's all I've got for the rest of my life. I've no more of oh. the So it's kind of, I, I should have, but uh, much rereading pleasure. All these books I'm talking about here today, they're all books I will, I will read again. Another writer, this is a book that's been sitting on my shelves for a few years. Uh, the book is of Strangers and Bees by Haz Hamid Ismailov, who's an Uzbek writer from Uzbekistan, uh, published by Tilt and Axis, who, right. as you know, publish, you know, just great work all the time. I, don't, I can't actually see what year this came out. Translated by Shelley Fairweather Vega. This is a really interesting book. I, I kind of almost find it impossible to describe. 2019. It, I have read it without realizing it's the second in a trilogy, so I have to go back and read the first one. It, it's about his experience as a writer in exile from Uzbekistan, trying to just bum his way around Europe. But it also has, it speaks back and splices in stories from history as well as sort of fantasy. And I, I say fantasy not in a sort of... Uh, okay, I can stop listening now because I don't like fantasy way. It's not fantasy in an annoying way. So it's, in other words, it's not trying to create a magical universe. It's more a sort of Arabian Nights fantasy. It's more that sort of way, um, you know, sort of folktale sort of type. So that was really impressed by his writing style. It reminded me, it's not, the, well, kind of, it's not Kensaburo Oe, the mm -hmm. Japanese writer, but it reminds me of him in the way that he writes about his own life and himself where he's very much the minor character, you know, so writing about putting himself as the minor character in a wider narrative. So I really, again, just a writer who just keeps you on the page the whole time. Again, this is a book I've had on my shelf for years without reading, even though I loved everything else I read by the author, and it's Zone by Matthias Ennard. Mm -hmm. French writer, has won every prize going, really, except the Booker and um, the Nobel Prize. A really clever guy, he speaks several languages fluently. But this is about a guy getting a train, he's going to Rome from Milan to Rome, and essentially, he's involved in a lot of possibly criminal activity. He's a former soldier in the Yugoslav War and has committed crimes there, and almost a way of ensuring his future financial stability and protecting himself from being implicated in those, he's essentially going to reveal all his secret papers. And essentially it's a stream of consciousness, single sentence novel, a long one, it's about 500 pages, that takes you through his mind in that journey. And it sounds very European black and white movie, but he's got an astonishing brain, Matthias Inert. He is a beautiful writer. He has a sort of, uh, like Dasha Dernich, this sort of, way of teaching you about 20th century history without you realizing it's an amazing book it's not it's been on my shelf for for years and i keep saying that's going to be really good but i'm not going to pick it up till i know i'm going to read it and i read it slowly over a few weeks and every night i opened it i was like i can't wait for this i just loved it i loved it charlotte mandel is the is the translator who's an amazing translator she's translated proust and people like that so she's top class only two more books. Another Fitzcarraldo, Adam Mars Jones. Have you, I don't know if you, have you read him before? Yes, I have, but not that one. I think, were you talking about Pilcrow and... Um... That's right, I was. And yeah, yeah. forthcoming yeah. books. The Finally, the third in the trilogy is coming out this year. Yeah, I think... Pilcrow I think... and... Uh, Sedilla. And then... Sedilla. Yeah, last... so, so I think I bought them on a strength of your video, actually, because I, I read a review he did of Weather by Jenny Offal. It was a review. I ha I used to have a subscription to the, the London Review of Books, uh, and I gave it up because I just couldn't keep up with reading them. So I started reading them again. I'm up as far as March 2020, 
and I read a review he did of Weather by Jenny Offal. It was a critical review, but it was done with such attention and intelligence that I think he actually, um, in my view, honoured the writer by look, reading their work so carefully. He's known as a tough reviewer. He, he does, uh, he's, been, he's a theatre and film reviewer as well, I think. But he's a very good writer himself. Now, he, he, he's very good at a particular thing, which is where you have somebody, a single voice, talking at you for 150 pages. So I've read this and Box Hill. They're both like that. And in a way, they remind me a bit of, if you've ever seen the Talking Heads series by Alan Bennett, I don't know if you know those, but it, Alan oh, Bennett, the, the English playwright, he has a series of about a dozen short plays all about an hour long where it's just one person talking to the camera and it's a bit like that this one's about a very cheerful guy he's a civil engineer in is it armenia he's in yeah i'm not 100 percent sure where it is but essentially it's it's part of the, the fall of the balkan war he's there at a very difficult time and it's just his experience being on the ground his sort of personal life is falling around in the background but he's one of these very sort of cheerful upbeat people and the kind of person you don't really see in literature that much because they're not serious. And he's not a serious thinker. So he, had to, he, just, he just picks up the rhythm of the speech and the, the sort of cheerful, uh, you know, it's like your neighbor who's always in good, good mood. You know, it's that kind of guy. But the person you wouldn't in, investigate much because you think, I think I know everything I need to know about them. But it's actually, he finds good depth. So yeah, I actually bought Sedilla and Pilcrow, I think, on, on your recommendation. So I'm going to try yes. and read I'm going to try and read those maybe by the summer if I can, and then I might see about the third one. But then again, I might not do any of that. But I have a few books I've lined up this year, big books. And and I know I owe you a read of Kane, which we're reading together, and I'm, I'm only about 30 pages into, so I need to get my arse in gear for that. You think we're not reading it together, but it's a great buddy read so far. <laughs> Flawless buddy read. Uh, but I will catch up with you on that. Yeah. The last one is, uh, again, a book that's been on my shelves for years. The Door, Magda Zabo, the Hungarian writer. Uh, a colleague of mine in work is Hungarian, actually. It's translated by Len Ricks. And she tells me that this is not typical of Magda Zabo's work. But again, very interesting. A bit like Patlava Lake, uh, in the sense that it's a character study, in that she has this very mercurial, almost voodoo-type cleaner of her apartment. He was a very strong personality and exercises this kind of weird magnetism uh, over the people in her life. And it's sort of a study of that woman from afar. Kind of, I think, almost autobiographical. The author is um, slightly afraid of this woman, I think. Uh, I have read this one, I will admit. This is the only one so far that I've read, I think. Yeah. Yeah, what did you think of it? Um, I absolutely hated her. Passionately hated her. So it colored my whole experience of the novel. It was very well written, but I couldn't stand her. I just hated her so. Oh. Hated the so. cleaner or the narrator? No, the cleaner. The way she treated her dog and stuff. Oh, I just thought she was evil. Yeah, I think you were supposed to think that. <laughs> but, but I uh, guess I, I, I extrapolated it to the fact that I didn't enjoy the book because I really I wanted her to have died much earlier in the novel. I would have enjoyed it more. What's interesting, the, the opening of the novel, the first few pages are completely different from the rest of it. And I opened this a few times because I bought this and lots of people I know, including Wendy Eskin actually loved this book. And I opened the first couple of pages and thought, I'm not in a mood for a sort of slow, they open the door, they close the door, they look behind the door. I'm not in the mood for that. And then the rest of the book is completely different. So, uh, so it, it wins the award for you know, start on page six. It's one of the few novels I've read where the, the opening is is a complete uh, red herring, you know. But, and uh, I wish I'd stopped on page five. <laughs> <laughs> you were enjoying it up to page six. It's been absolutely delightful. Um, uh, and I, I bought half the books that you recommended the last time we did this. And I've read a few of them, but I'm, uh, there's quite a few on read. And now I'm going to spend the rest of this year accumulating all these. What a fascinating array of books, as always. Um, before I let you go, Ronan, what are you working on or what can we expect from, from your writing desk next? Yeah, well, I've just finished uh, editing my next, do my own edits on Ghost Mountain, which is, which is going to be out in May 2024. Ghost so uh, so it's, uh, I won't say much about it, it's, but it's been, I've really enjoyed writing it. I think it's a bit, it's, it's shifted my style 
normally my first two books I wrote at night, you know, uh, 10 o'clock till midnight, five, six nights a week for a burst of time, three, four months, and then edited, edited them after that. This one I decided because, you know, I, I was saying, well, if I'm going to keep doing this, I need to pace myself. So I, I just wrote in short period, short bursts, maybe twice a week. I wrote, you know, short chapters, short sentences. I really tried to, I described in interviews as what I call heron writing. So if you look at a heron, a heron will just wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and then grab. And when, they, when a heron moves, it actually moves in two movements because it, it, it corrects for the refraction of light through the water. So it does very precise, quick movements. So what I'm trying to do is before my writer instincts kick in and I writerify the whole thing to get in and write it in a smash and grab and then get out of there. So not to, not to really get as fresh as I can into it, not to let whatever style I've developed try and uh, interrupt or shape the, the, the core crude idea too much. And I was also influenced by, because I was working from home during the pandemic and my eyes, I wouldn't be able to print off things to read them. Because if you're reading a lot, I read a lot of work, so printing is it wasn't possible. So I started using the uh, read aloud function on Microsoft Word, where it'll read it on screen. And partly actually influenced by what you, something you said, which is around some of your best reading experiences has been reading with the audiobook. That's right. So, so I noticed when I read on screen, almost like karaoke, where it's reading it out to me as it, as it bounces from word to word, I felt my recall was better, my reten you know, my comprehension was better. And then I started using it to edit what I was working on in the early stages of Ghost Mountain. And the voice of the read aloud, which is a voice I chose called Junior, which is kind of like a kind of like a 10 year old boy's voice, American voice, but it sounds kind of vulnerable. That became the narrative voice in my head. So instead of having my usual roll on voice, I was writing not just in Junior's voice, but in what I imagined was Junior's mindset. So I ended up writing that was really important to me. Uh, and actually, when I changed my computer, because I went from a, a, a Windows to an Apple, I didn't have Junior's voice. And I had some like, middle aged Irish woman's voice. And I was like, I can't lose Junior. Junior's my whole thing. So, uh, so I had to get it back and eventually I worked it out. But um, so it was it's just interesting, you know, when your pro, when your process changes, your writing changes. So writing shorter bursts and I'm really happy with it. And my wife is reading at the moment. I read every, what I do was I'd write a chapter twice a week. Chapter might be only a page and a half. Every time I wrote one, I would read it to my wife in bed that night. Uh, which sounds like a terrible passion killer, but she was she was she was okay about it. It wasn't I wasn't I wasn't enforcing it on her, right? But she so so she has heard the book. Say there's a hundred chapters in it, a hundred bedtime stories. So now she's just reading it back as a sort of beta read, you know. And then I have to give it to my publisher in, in May, and then we go to editing, and it'll be published uh, May next year. So I'm I'm really excited, but it feels like I felt I really enjoyed writing the book. It felt easy to write. Panenka was hard to write, just emotionally it was in a dark sort of corner of my psyche. This felt really, I felt really energized and I felt I could write it forever actually. And I don't know what people are going to think about it. I've no sort of perspective on that really and I'm not really too focused on that at this stage, but I'm really excited about it and I'm really, I'm dying to see what, what people think of it. Well, I'm excited. That What a fascinating uh, process you described there. This is a little bit flippant, but I don't really mean it flippantly. Will you have the audiobook done in that software voice? Do you know what? I would love to. If I could get away with it, I would. Yeah. Uh, and actually, what I w if I can't do that, and I probably won't be allowed to do that, what I would certainly love to do is to do some readings where I get Junior to read the book. Mm -hmm. You know, where I just do it on a laptop and hook it up. You know, and I would, I would have the, the, the text on screen so they can see the words each word getting highlighted as it, so they can understand because it really does affect it made the text and the writing it's much more reiterative so it would say something like you know sean is on his computer sean is talking to ron on his computer ron is on his computer they are at their computer end of paragraph you know you kind of just you end up this sort of way it's, it's a beautiful rhythm where the mind corrects itself, clarifies itself, refines itself, and then moves on. You know, it's kind of, and it's really, yeah, so it works really well. 
Well, I would like to pre-book you for when the book comes out, and uh, it would love it if you could do one of those engine hook up one of those readings and then for that. Deal, absolutely delighted. To... Oh gosh, Ronan, I, I could still talk uh, if I wasn't such an old man. I could I could listen to you for several more hours. Um, so I hope you'll come back. Uh, anytime, Sean. It's been we're, it's been lovely to to catch up with you and. Uh, Thanks as always for having me. I, I, it's a regular Friday treat for me at the end of the week to, to stick on the kettle and to catch up with your reading habits. And I always enjoy it. I love those and... tweets Ronan uh, sends out. Uh, oh, there's this there's time to put on the kettle. The Sean's Friday reads is there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Take care, Sean. Mm -hmm.